Hi, I'm Dawn Garish. I'm a co-founder of the Life Writing Collective, which is a non-profit organization that helps people, they inspire people to write about their own lives as a tool for mental health, for physical well-being, and for community engagement and building. Herman Tembo Reiter's memoir is a very important and valuable contribution to the time of HIV AIDS pandemic. He worked for MSF and he worked for TAC, the Medicine Sans Frontier and Treatment Action Campaign, to help people um, engage with their own health care. I'm also a doctor, so I'm very interested in what he has done here. It's very different from what we are taught as medical students, where you ask somebody who's suffering from a, a condition, you ask them very specific questions to fit into an algorithm, which kind of fits into a box, and then you find the treatment box that goes with, you know, that um, goes together with that. So Hermann's contribution to this idea of well-being and health is immensely valuable because he, he, his approach is to empower people in their own health care, to inspire people to be interested in their own well-being and to, to be activists in their own health care, even when it's breaking an unjust law, like for example, dispensing medicine or getting access to ARVs. So I think that this book is something that all healthcare workers should read for their own inspiration around how to work with their own ill health and others. So I'd like to hand over to Herman, who is here with us, to talk about his very important book. Managing an ARV program in contest with government opposition brought some stresses with it. We had experimented with fluconazole, importing it illegally from Thailand into South Africa. With that, we had provoked only one pharmaceutical company and their patent was nearly expired anyway. But now we had imported generic ARVs and dispensed them to our patients. First line ARVs were patented by four different companies and their patents were only expire after 15 years or more. Fluconazole was only required by selected patients. ARVs were needed by all people living with HIV. This was an undertaking of a new dimension. Kailicha can be a morbid place, especially sightsee. The road to the clinic is lined by makeshift tables built of pellets hammered together for various traders. When I passed in the morning, numerous fires smolder, heating water in 200 litre drum cauldrons. By the time the truck from the abattoir arrives, the water is boiling and the sheep heads and tripe can be dropped into the water. These will be ready for lunch, a favorite amongst the nurses. Behind the line of hawkers starts the ocean of shacks, an amalgamation of knocked together corrugated metal sheets. The only outside space is a narrow corridor to someone else's door. Most people who call this home have left an organized life in a rural area which was governed by family traditions and have swapped it for life in a shanty town for motives that are difficult for me to comprehend. Work, better healthcare, better schools. Usually I keep my phone off during consultations. Today it is on. I don't want to miss any call. Sure enough it rings. Eric. Hi Eric. They're coming your way. Expect them at Site C in 15 minutes. What must I do? Just keep a straight head. Let them do what they have to do. Bye. A straight head? Impossible. I try to continue my work seeing patients. I don't know how long the interruption will be and people should not have to wait too long. My heart pounds in my neck. My fingers struggle to hold the pen as I try to write notes about my patient. Usually I pride myself to pay individual attention to each service user and their moods. Today it is different. I have to repeat questions and notice that I still do not know what the person in front of me has answered. Eric was used to coping with stress. He had been negotiator for MSF when MSF staff was taken hostage in Sarajevo. 
and MSF policy was clear, never to bend down to kidnappers, and never to agree to any money to release the hostage. Eric has experienced several civil wars. Eric had survived a kamikaze landing in the forests of South Sudan with a tipsy Russian pilot to see if MSF could intervene in the outbreak of hemorrhagic fever. Eric had led the Brussels office of MSF, one of the busiest in the world. Why had Eric decided to send them to Site C? Why would he not come with them? What did you say? How long has the itchy skin been bothering you? I tried to focus on my consultation. Finally, the unwelcome visitors arrive. Officials from the Medicines Control Council. They enter and without introducing themselves, bark. Where do you keep your illegal ARVs? Instinctively, I assume that as a doctor at the clinic, I need to take charge of the situation and calmly or at least that is what I tried, introduced myself and shook their hands. Eric, the director of MSF, had informed us the previous day that the Medicines Control Council had let him know that they would come to inspect the MSF pharmacy. After MSF received its first consignment of generic ARVs from Brazil in the suitcases of Nomantla Yako and Matthew Damane, ARV users of Site C MSF Clinic, MSF had, in the meantime, received a bigger consignment by Korea. We did not want to keep the news of generic fixed dose combination ARV secret, but we also were cautious not to provoke too early. However, it appears that the Medicines Control Council had heard about this sooner than we had anticipated. Filled with fear that they would confiscate our entire generic ARV supply, we had as precaution provided all ARV users we could find on short notice with three months supply of ARVs. This would hopefully see them through until we could get stock again. Furthermore, we had decided to distribute all left stock to the three ARV clinics, hoping that the Medicines Control Council might just inspect MSF bulk stock in our office. They tried to brush me aside and make their way to my consultation room, in which the steel cabinet was filled to the brim with life-saving ARVs. But I held one hand in an attempt to prolong the handshake, while planning what to do. But a handshake can't last forever. Non to Zelo, the MSF nurse, had her door open and decided to continue consulting her patient. We could see how she explained to the patient how to prepare ARVs into a pillbox. My mind spun in circles. These were pharmacists who saw themselves as being tasked to protect the public by enforcing good pharmaceutical practice. Would our steel cabinet appease their pedantic criteria of how medicine should be stored? Would they object to the use of pillboxes MSF provided to each ARV user to promote good adherence? A practice our service users cherished like their cell phones but most pharmacists criticized with the concern that tablets might lose their quality. Would they object to MSF nurse prescribing ARVs overstepping her scope of practice? Would they object to MSF nurse actually dispensing ARVs contravening good pharmaceutical practice? All these concerns flashed through my mind as I was trying to keep a poker face, still shaking his hand. Don Zelo's door was half open. Would she come and join me? No. She decided to carry on instructing a patient in front of her on the names of the ARVs and how to pack them into the pillbox. All in clear view of the officials I was hoping to block. At that moment, I wanted to scream at Non Zelo for doing the work I had taught her to do and not having the insight to hide this in front of these officials. But I also felt some pride of her completely undermining what these officials stood for. All to save their lives, a task the Department of Health had avoided, claiming it was impossible. My concern, however, were unfounded. They only had one objective in mind, that was to seize the generic ARVs and impound them. The service users whose lives literally depended on these ARVs 
intuitively could see through these officials, not being flustered by all the complex concerns I had, and they stood up as one wall and on the beat of their tech song formed a barricade between the officials and the door to my consultation room. The prefab building shook and wobbled as the patients brought their feet down in unison. They changed their tune to that of a toy toy, a kind of struggle dance, and came closer to the officials. I could see their eyes widening with fear, and I quickly nudged them towards the door, not my consultation room, but that to the outside. They allowed me to usher them to the outside and gave a deep sigh of relief as we stepped into the open and they made a beeline to their car. They shouted, this is not the last time you will see us. Next time we will come with the police. They never came back, nor did the police. The generic AVs went where they were destined for, into people's tummies, into their bloodstreams, fighting HIV. I had forgotten how hot and windy the Cape Flats can be in summer, how the gusting wind draws up the Ishmael sands and peppers the face, blasts the sides of homes and windows. We, Sindiso and I, were walking through the dunes of one of the unplanned settlements trying to track down Nonsikilelo. My face was covered in sweat and dust and sand was squeaking in my shoes. Several times I verged on giving up, but Sindiuswa was determined that we would find her and kept on. This was November 2019, and for much of the preceding year, I had been writing up some memories of my years in HIV care, mostly the period from 1999 to 2006, when I was an active member of the Treatment Action Campaign and then working with Doctors Without Borders, MSF, in Kailicha and later in Lusikisiki in the rural Eastern Cape. This memory project was perhaps an attempt to survive the depression by reliving those significant events. I was going back in the hope of finding a way forward. I had visited Mantla Majola to discuss the idea. For many years, Mantla was leading the community activities of Tech in Cape Town. After leaving Tech, he started the Movement for Change and Social Justice which operated from a garage in Guguletu. Chatting to Mandla in the garage, I also met Sindiswa, and it had humbled me to find that she was as energetic as ever, and just as willing to help others. She had, moreover, kept in touch with many of the people from Tech in Guguletu and in Kailija, and it was clear that if anyone would be able to find my first patients, then it was her. Her own life had not been at all easy. Years before, she had noticed a lump in her breast, which was ultimately found to be cancer. She had had a mastectomy and required chemotherapy. From the moment she was initiated on ARVs, through all of life's challenges, Sindiswa continued to take her ARVs and had maintained an undetectable viral load. Moreover, being a true patient advocate, she had started providing psychosocial support and treatment education to cancer survivors, just as she had done for HIV patients for the last 19 years. Sindiswa had been one of the most active members of TAC. Apart from being active in both Guguletu and Kailicha, she had also returned to her home of Queenstown, building 21 tech branches in the rural area of the Eastern Cape. For a time, Sindiswa had counseling work with an NGO, that supported cancer survivors, but she was unemployed now, living in a single room shack in the backyard in Guguletu. But that had not stopped her from identifying a number of people in her community who had a stroke or were bedridden or too frail to attend clinics on their own, and then making a plan with the nurses in Guguletu to collect the chronic medication for her patients. Our first visit on that day was to the neighborhood where Busisiwa was said to live. We found her easily. She had recently started selling homemade macheu at the Mfuleni taxi rink close to Kailija. We spotted Busisiwa in amongst men and women who were roasting meat on fires on half oil drums. 
Moments later, she embraced me to her bosom, lifting my feet clear of the ground. Full volume sobs were in my ears, whether sorrow or joy, I do not know. I do know that her reaction touched me deeply, and I noticed my own tears dripping onto her neck. She put me down again and planted a fat kiss on my lips. We then sat chatting and drinking Machio for hours. Usisiwe, like Sindiswe, had been part of the treatment support group established by Nokhawe in Langa, and like Sindiswe, she had been bold enough to agree to feature in the TV program called Beat It here in Oba, later becoming a presenter on that show. Next, we went to find Matthew Damana, who was busy preparing for her uncle's funeral, but agreed to meet with us. For a few years, Matthew had worked with an HIV NGO, managing to build a small house with an extra room in the backyard. But since losing his job, he said he had been living in the backyard room, living off the rent he received for the main house. Matthew was perturbed. He confessed that he supported relatives and struggled to make ends meet. He clearly needed to talk through his issues, but I wasn't sure I was the right person to hear him as I detected bitterness in her voice when talking about MSF and tech. When a soccer star retires, the club keeps paying them a pension. But when we retired from tech, we got nothing. It was not just money that he felt robbed of, but a sense of belonging and then self-esteem that comes with it. Tamba, to my patients I was Tamba, I was a hero. Matthew Damana was always popular. When MSF wanted a speaker, they would ask for me. Now I am a nobody, he lamented. He related how after 10 years of taking ARVs religiously, he decided one day to stop them, explaining that they brought him no more joy, no more fame. They just reminded him that he had a life-threatening disease. From that point, there were no more support groups, no organized peer support to sustain him. He fell into a depressed state. When I gave him my written account of his contribution to the struggle for openness and access to ARVs, he said, What you write about me is all true, but I am not sure you can use my name in a book. I have a new partner, and I have not told about my HIV status. This was Matthew Damane, who in 2000 had gone to all 17 women he had slept with to disclose to them and counsel them to have an HIV test. It was when dating this lady that has decided to get back onto ARVs. I had heard that U is equal to U. I went to different clinic though because I could not show my face at Site C clinic. They would have been mad at me. I pretended I was a new patient, but the sister could trace that I had interrupted. U is equal to U is an abbreviation for undetectable equals untransmittable, meaning that a person who takes AAVs correctly, therefore preventing the virus from multiplying to a point where the virus is undetectable in their blood, cannot transmit HIV to a sexual partner even when having sex without a condom. Listening to Matthew made me realize how I had followed a similar path to him. When the Department of Health took sincere ownership of the ARV program after years of denial and lukewarm engagement, there was suddenly no great enemy to battle, and victories were harder to achieve. No longer the hero, I moved on. In a sense, I totally got Matthew. For some, an incentive is needed to continue engagement with chronic care. Not necessarily a financial incentive, but for some, a day of celebration. Every so often, for those who have been on ARVs for many years, or those who attend health services with their sexual partner, or some form of recognition for the ones who have recruited five new people onto ARVs. To really ensure long-term adherence in all chronic illnesses, the Department of Health needs to look at ways to make service users feel special and involved in promoting healthcare. It makes perfect sense that there should be a budget for this, given how much money is spent on managing the complications that occur when people have interrupted treatment. 
Eric had told me that MSF and the Department of Health in the Western Cape were busy with something called Welcome Services, an initiative aimed at ensuring that nurses are supportive when people return to clinics after treatment interruption. I encouraged Matthew to see if he could not contribute to this campaign and become a somebody in his own eyes again. Matthew phoned me two weeks later and said I could use his name. I have discussed my status with my partner. She's okay with it. Now we were trying to track down Nancy Kilelo, who years before had asked me to bring her ARVs, which she had forgotten at the hospital, to her one night so that she would not miss a dose. Sindiswa was aware that she had moved from her old neighborhood but was not quite sure where to. We resolved to start our search at her old shack and see if somebody there could help us. Yes, her old neighbors informed us she had moved to another unplanned settlement because people there were apparently being promised government funded houses and she wanted to get on the list. After some searching in that area, we found someone who told us that Nancy Kalelo's son was driving a taxi. We could not find the son at the nearby rank, but someone there knew where he lived. We drove deep into the informal settlement to get to the house, and although he was not home, somebody in that house described to us where Nancy Kalelo now lived. When we tried to leave, a truck delivering soup at a soup kitchen was blocking the passage, and we had to wait until all soup had been served. I felt my patience growing thin, and my mood was not helped when in the neighborhood where Nancy Kalelo was said to live, we ran out of roadway and had to continue on foot, quickly becoming lost. I cursed the sand and the heat, the rubbish, and the government that allowed people to live in squalor in these coastal sand dunes. I was thirsty and hungry, agitated and ready to kill when we reached the door of Nancy Kalelo's shack. Timber, I can't believe it, Nancy Kalelo said, her strained voice croaking. I can't stand up properly, she added half apologetically, but sit down and meet my new husband. Nancy Kalelo had been in a taxi accident and had suffered a C5 neck fracture. She had been in coma for several days, but then recovered. A fracture of the fifth neck vertebra, cervical vertebra number five, usually leads to a partial paralysis of the arm. If the fracture was higher up in the neck, the diaphragm would have been paralyzed <coughs> and she would have been unable to breathe. However, with C5 fracture, the breathing is weakened but functioning sufficiently to survive. I assumed that the nerve to her vocal cords had also been partially damaged, causing modulation of her voice. After lots of physiotherapy, Nonsiculelo had learned to walk again for short distances with crutches. After taking this in and trying to picture how she managed the sand dunes on her crutches, I asked about her ARVs. She dropped her head. Tamba, I defaulted while I was in hospital. My husband lost a job. It was terrible. I was depressed. After discharge from hospital, I stopped going to the clinic. Was it not the difficulty of getting on your crutches to the clinic that made you interrupt ARVs? I asked. No. I could have gone, but I was too depressed. And now I was contemplating when to ask about suicidal thoughts. If you wish to die, there's little point in taking ARVs. But she interrupted my question. Now I'm on ARVs again. I got MDR-TB, multidrug resistant tuberculosis. I was admitted at Brooklyn Chest TB Hospital. They started me on ARVs again. And your depression? They counseled me at the hospital. The depression is better now. I felt very humble now. I had been secretly cursing the inconvenience of having to walk these dunes in the heat with my able body and the car waiting to take me to a shower, an auto bank, a restaurant, whatever I wanted. But here with me in this corrugated iron check was Sindiswa, who dedicated her life to the daily task of nursing people in her community despite still being on hormonal cancer treatment and ARVs herself. And on my left, Nancy Kilelo, her body half paralyzed, sick with MDR-TB and HIV and depression. Yet, she looking lovingly at her unemployed partner, 
who she had met at the ARV clinic. Was there no way, I wondered, that our health services or social services could help to get Nonsekilelo on a fast track of a government-built house, accessible by street and the wheelchair? I got the strength for from becoming part of, of TAC. Yeah. The activism itself gave mm. me the strength yes. yeah. to be the person I am today. And that relief that you felt of, I don't have to hide, I can actually talk about it. Yeah. Mm. It gave you the courage to encourage others again. Yes. Exactly. And look, uh, these days it's quiet about HIV. Nothing is being said about HIV. You know, we've gotten to a point where as if HIV doesn't exist anymore, mm. but it still does because because there's still HIV. People are still um, battling with HIV. They are still battling with other things attached to HIV besides the disease itself, like 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 mental health in in, in most of us. Um, but we are quiet. Nothing is being mm. said anymore. We are quiet. We have moved on. And because of this quietness, people do not adhere to their treatment because there is no longer activism mm. that we mm. had mm. that time. Mm. You see, and what frustrates me, people, they die. They. They die mm, and mm, they unnecessary. and they leave be behind the orphans mm, mm, and mm. the the grannies and the grandfathers look after those mm. grandchildren mm. and you can notice that that is that is when I discovered that there is depression mm. in our communities and depression is not only on us from. The children because they don't get that enough care because the, the parents are no longer there. Mm. Mm. And but for me, I mean, Doctors Without Borders and Tech has achieved so much in terms of getting ARVs into yeah. the public health service, in terms of letting people feel open about the HIV, mm. helping their own mental health to accept the HIV. Mm. Um, and it's interesting to hear how you say it's kind of normal now. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And part of writing these stories, I want to change healthcare workers to bring back activism because we've got many problems in our health system. Mm. HIV is still the biggest problem. There's yes. TB, there's hypertension, diabetes, mm. um, mental health problems. And all of them, we would be much more successful in treating if we involved the service users mm. at the same level that we involve people in the treatment action campaign. Mm. Mm. And I mean, I, I, I realized that with tech, we had an enemy of Man Tushabalalam Simang and the president who opposed us. But still, um, there was a feeling that you belonged mm. Mm. and your input was valuable in the health mm. services and still now we don't we struggle with health services but we don't involve people to help us to provide proper services and, and Herman to add on what you are saying there is a huge difference between, between Italy Fontaine district and Kailicha district mm -hmm. because the nurses this side or, or employees this side are more informed than Italy Fontaine District. I say this many times. You so you say 15 years later, the nurses here have got a different attitude towards people and yes. they're better informed. Yes. So the HIV program in Kalicha is yes. better than in yes. other areas yeah, of Capital? Yes. Mm. And how does the community see that? Because I mean, does, it, does it have an impact on the community? You see, in other HIV? clinics, uh, people ended up not going to fetch their treatment because mm. there is no confidentiality, you see. Mm. You mm. see, here in Kayalicha, everyone, 
<laughs> most people they accepted their status you see yeah. and uh, the attitude of the nurses is fine you you understand what i'm saying they understand the language of mm. the hiv mm. and treatment you, mm. you, you, you see but so you the said... reason for that in kailisha is because a lot of activisms kind yeah. of started here and msf is here it was started and here in... was yeah he was here you mm. see 